any greetings or niceties, I'm just going to toss some questions at you by way of introducing the topic. So I'm going to ask you guys to think about the last recital that you attended that you really enjoyed. Was it a solo recital, a studio recital? Was it a, a chamber recital? Was it an orchestra? Was it even classical? Uh, who was performing? Were you there because it was somebody famous? Were you there because you had to be there? It was your kid? Were you there because it was one of your students? Was it your own recital? Where was this recital? A nice auditorium? A church? A classroom? The lobby of a nursing home? Who was your audience? Parents of your students? Fellow music majors? Your uh, faculty members? And why were you there? Again, did you have to be? Did you pay a hundred bucks to be there? Um, what's the ticket free? Of course, think about the music. What was played? Was it the repertoire that brought you there, or was it repertoire you'd never heard before, but you still wanted to be there? Um, in what order was the repertoire played? Do you remember all the pieces? Was there variety? Um, did the pieces go together well? Was the recital as a whole satisfying? Now, all these questions are to get you thinking about my topic today, which is one that we all have to deal with, whether as teachers or performers or audience members, um, but yet one that surprisingly does not have a lot of formal research, and this is the uh, practice of selecting repertoire for our recitals. Now, the piano recital is a standard curricular requirement at the college level, um, and in a lot of undergrads see it as a kind of rite of passage, because for many undergrads who give the recital, this is their first, for many times, their for first full-length solo recital. They're not sharing the program with anyone. They're not, um, you know, sharing anything with anyone. It's their recital. And the fact that it's a piano recital is interesting because we do have, as many have wrote, written about, possibly the largest solo repertoire of any standard concert instrument. And the nature of our instrument is one of the few that can be a solo recital. Um, I once went to a solo tuba recital at Lincoln Center, and I'm biased, I guess, as a pianist. That's not quite the same thing. So questions remain, the questions remain, regardless of whatever recital you were thinking about and your own experiences, how do performers select their pieces? And on the flip side, how do teachers assign the pieces to their students? <clears throat> so most formal research on piano recital repertoire selection that's been done focuses on the professional level recital, the artist recital. And these are uh, performers who have all kinds of repertoire at their fingertips. You know, of course, very useful. Um, today I'm talking more about the recital from a pedagogical standpoint. Um, and the focus will be more on the um, the undergraduate recital, but yet I'm hoping teachers from all levels will be able to think about uh, recital repertoire selection. Now this topic becomes even more relevant when we think about the state of classical music, which, you know, it's, it's no secret that we have been fighting this crisis as a legitimate art form, and the piano recital has been kind of held up as the exhibit A of here's what needs to change about classical music. Um, numerous critics have written about it being a, a museum culture, or Joseph Horwitz wrote about it in 1980, by the way, of it being boring and superfluous and dependent on the same repertoire. Now, for a pianist in the 21st century who are presumably on the job market, one of the things they do have to think about is what kind of repertoire are they programming? Um, you know, we can't just perform the same pieces over and over again. We can within certain, I guess, academic bubbles, but realistically speaking, our job, or at least our, you know, the job we're trying to think about beyond academia is reaching out and attracting new audiences. Furthermore, the role of the pianist as just a performer kind of doesn't exist. Um, you know, pianists should be thinking about repertoire selection from not only a performance standpoint, but from a teaching standpoint as well. And I argue that our knowledge of the repertoire should extend beyond the canon or the standard repertoire. <clears throat> so today's purpose is, before we can think about recital repertoire selection for the 21st century, I want us to think about how we've chosen recitals, excuse me, how we've chosen repertoire traditionally 
for recitals that we've either taught students for or performed in ourselves. And hopefully those initial questions that I pose to you will have you thinking about uh, repertoire selection from the musical standpoint, but there are also social and pedagogical factors that affect how repertoire is selected. And then sub-purposes you could think about are what is effective recital programming? What, what makes a good recital? Do we just choose repertoire because we're forced to? What is the definition of standard repertoire for our instrument? Why are certain composers and certain works performed more often than others? And again, repertoire selection is something that we should be thinking about not just as a performer, but also as a teacher of our own students. So, all music teachers have to ask in relation to repertoire selection, how do I choose music for my students to play? All performers have to ask, what do I want to perform versus what should I perform? Sadly, those are two separate questions. We don't often get to plan our recitals by, um, you know, what do I want to perform? And then on the flip side, all audience members have to ask, why do I want to attend this recital? And then afterwards, did I enjoy this recital? And then after that, would I hear this performer again? So, like I said, today's focus is on the undergraduate piano major recital, um, but I'm hoping it'll have an application to all teachers and performers. <clears throat> so, in my research into this topic, um, my, the review of the available literature, there isn't much out there, but I approached it from what I call the three R's. Uh, first of all, research into the recital itself. The piano recital, as a concert-going format, is one that is kind of relatively recent, if we think about music concerts in general. And of course, we know how much influence Liszt had in kind of shaping the way we think about recitals today. And in fact, many of the conventions that we take for granted, such as the fact that there's only one performer, or the fact that our, recital, that our repertoire is generally expected to be memorized, or the fact that the audience has to be quiet and sit there and applaud at the very end, those are all conventions that weren't always there. Those are conventions that shape the recital going experience. Um, I also thought, did research on this from the roles of not just the audience, excuse me, not just the artist, but also the audience, because they play obviously a vital role in the recital as well. Of course, the repertoire. Now, the evolution of the piano as a solo instrument, you know, if you think about the evolution, the mechanics of the piano, you know, it's no, it's no coincidence that as our pianos became larger and louder, the addition of the pedal, the wider keyboard range, that also coincided with the type of repertoire that was written for it. And of course, we have all these legends of Beethoven being dissatisfied with his piano and breaking strings, and Liszt writing music that was considered transcendental because that instrument couldn't possibly handle it. All of these things shape the repertoire that audiences kind of expect to hear which again plays into what gets selected and why. And then the third R, which I found um, kind of completely ignored by a lot of the research on repertoire is more pedagogical. And that is at the undergraduate level, or really any teaching level, the relationship between student and professor. The one-to-one -one relationship that a teacher forms with their student is going to have a profound effect on how repertoire is chosen or assigned for recitals. So four key questions that I'm gonna to try to get at today, if not answer, but at least to raise for you guys, again, is how is piano rep recital repertoire chosen? Two, what makes a good recital program? Three, who decides what is performed? Does the teacher, does the student, do the audience, or do other people, like judges or parents, recording execs, you know, the concert director, do they decide what is performed? And then finally, what defines standard repertoire and what makes it standard? So I'm not going to go into too much, but my, my dissertation on this topic, the uh, research design I decided on, was kind of went across, against a lot of the existing more quantitative research and I decided to do a collective case study on specific pianists. And a case study, um, many of you know who have done a lot of, of uh, research 
you know, focuses on a single situation or a single case. And a collective case study takes a number of different cases and looks at them through the same analytical lens. So for my research, my cases were undergraduate piano majors at a large public university, and the data was their undergraduate degree recital program. Now at the school that I looked at, um, undergrad piano majors were required to do a junior and a senior uh, recital as the part of their degree program. Some folks may elect to do what's called a special recital if their teacher deems them ready, um, like their freshman or sophomore year. Um, typically those are a little bit shorter or often shared with one other person. And it was important because there was also a distinction between graduate recitals and also graduate lecture recitals, which were a little bit different in, in affecting how repertoire would be chosen. Um, the research design acknowledges that each pianist would take a different approach to planning their recital. It also acknowledges that each pianist might choose the same piece for different reasons, or each teacher might assign the same piece for different reasons. It also acknowledges that each recital is in and itself a unique event. So again, the same piece might appear on different recital programs, but for very different reasons. And finally, the very subjective nature of music of art and of the recital going experience is all subjective. So my research design, I think, ad addressed the subjectivities of all of these factors quite well. So as a pilot study, before I conducted the uh, collective case study um, as one of my descriptive research classes, this was a quantitative number crunching side that I just wanted to get through. Um, I did a really basic quantitative analysis of a decade's worth of recital programs at the undergraduate level at the same institution. All I was doing was tallying up which composers were programmed most often on their recitals, just so I could arrive at a working definition for my study of what makes standard repertoire. So take a couple seconds. My research, based on going through 10 years of study, I was able to uncover 11 composers who, statistically speaking, stood out from the rest as the ones that appeared most often on recital programs. Make a list, or think about it, or discuss, who do you think those 11 composers would be? <laughs> Remember, these are undergraduate recitals, not graduate ones. I, uh, when I was doing this, I could think of like five or six right off the bat. And then I had to struggle to fill the rest of the list, because of course you know more than 11 composers, but you get beyond five or six and then you think, wait, is that composer really standing? <laughs> All right, does everyone have a couple names jotted down? Who are some names that came up? Chopin. Chopin. Bach. 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 We just named our top three. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, let's go on. Brahms is, I think, there, yes. Mozart. Debussy is there, Mozart's there, but not as high as you think. Anyone else? Haydn's there. List is there, I think, for undergrads. But let's see. Oh, Rachmaninoff is there. Yes. Okay. So again, this is purely statistical, and this is just 10 years, and this is just at one school. But for a working definition of standard repertoire, here's who I came up with. In order. Beethoven, Chopin, Bach. The top three. List, Mozart, W.C. Haydn, Schubert, Rachmaninoff, and I was originally aiming for a top 10, but uh, statistically in my study, Schumann and Ravel ended up statistical tie, like point something of a percent, a thousandth of a percent. <laughs> so again, this is purely statistical, and my professor at the time, which kind of led to my dissertation, asked me, well, why do you think this is? You know, why, why do they, why are Beethoven, Chopin, and Bach, and by quite a wide margin, why were those three the top ones? Um, and then why these names and not other names? I think, yeah, Brahms is not there, actually. <laughs> I just realized. 
So based on these results, I was able to narrow down my potential cases, because I did want a mix of, of students who chose standard repertoire, and actually at the undergraduate level, everyone did, almost everyone did standard repertoire. You didn't see very many examples of, well, you, did, you would see on occasion one composer thrown in who kind of went outside the list, but by and large, these were the composers you would see. So can I ask, you know, yes, sir. the other piece of this is what the requirement is. Oh, we're going to get to that. <laughs> so that drives a lot of things. It absolutely does. So one of the things that uh, do, the, this whole approach, this case study approach, my qualitative approach to it addresses is that, again, every recital is subjective. And if you were to go by a purely statistical or just by the data itself without really delving in, it's easy to make assumptions. So here was one of the cases I looked at. And if you didn't know anything about this, you might look at this recital and think, gosh, what a random and weird um, undergraduate recital program, not to mention really short. <laughs> um, but one of the things I found out with this is, with every musician, every recital, every student, there are a number of factors about that would affect recital programming. For this particular student, as I found out, her teacher passed away in the middle of her junior year. She spent much of her junior and senior year without, you know, still trying to find a teacher while trying to put together a recital program. And what happened here was a lot of her planned repertoire with less than a semester to go had to be ditched. You know, that, which is why this recital program ended up about 30 minutes in length. You know, she wasn't, she was, the other thing was, she wasn't a performance major, rather she was a you know, pedagogy major. And so the, at this particular school, the recital requirements tended to be a little bit more casual. Now is that a good, you know, I'm not saying if that's a good or bad thing, but that's just what happens at this school, at, at this particular school. And statistically, you might look at this and think, boy, this, this student's a 20th century specialist or something like that, you know, but, you know, the, um, the Respighi piece is maybe four minutes. The Takamitsu is pretty substantial, but still relatively short compared to the rest of the recital. And the Bach piece, which I didn't even know what that was, that's a very short piece as well. <laughs> but it's interesting for me, as a researcher, to come across, you know, I didn't even know, I was like, a, a duet, oh, what is that? You know. <laughs> Turns out there's a whole bunch of these duettos that don't get programmed very often. So my data reporting, it was, you know, this was really fun because it was this kind of research and the data reporting lent itself to something more narrative based. It was like writing profiles or, you know, magazine length features on each of these students. And but based on the uh, hour long interviews I did with each of these cases on their recital programs, certain themes based on the coding process would emerge from these interviews. And the four main questions that I posed are explored from these different themes or codes that would keep coming up. And sometimes the code could be a single word, or sometimes it could be a recurring phrase. So for example, one of the recurring phrases that would keep coming up was graduate school auditions. <laughs> graduate school auditions. More often than not, the same exact semester that my recital happened. Why bother learning recital repertoire for both auditions and the recital? So, one of the key themes, how is the other recital repertoire chosen? At the undergraduate level, the influence of curriculum is one of the strongest influences, much more than, let's say, personal interest in a piece, personal desire or enjoyment of a piece. In fact, enjoyment rarely, if ever, came up. <laughs> right? It also rarely, if ever, came up from the teacher's standpoint. If any, uh, I, I, did I say I also included professors in this? And, yeah, you didn't hear a teacher say, I love teaching that piece. So, auditions, graduate school auditions were big. More often than not, a huge factor in how you would select repertoire for your recitals. And if you were to look at the requirements for um, master's programs, they kind of are the same <laughs> at each school. A piece by Bach, a classical sonata movement, a romantic work, and then 20th century and beyond is all thrown into its own category, except for Rachmaninoff. Right, that doesn't count. 
Uh, competitions, to a lesser extent, was also big. Right? If someone's preparing something for a competition, that could also you know, double as recital repertoire at the undergrad level. Uh, many students talked about coming to a piece from encountering it in their piano literature courses or their music history or music appreciation courses. More often than not, that was, of course, not taught by like, a piano professor either, which was interesting, but someone outside of piano who nonetheless brought them to that piece. And another interesting thing which came up, students who were either double majors in something else or if they were a music ed major, you know, that often came to, that often was a big influence. So for example, one of the students was a double um, organ performance major, so naturally a lot of contrapuntal music found his way into his recital. Um, another student who was a vocal major ended up doing a lot of Schubert on her recital. So a lot of times if someone is a double major in something else, that often can affect the type of repertoire that the teacher will assign. So. Again, it's easy to look at certain programs and think, boy, what a conservative or what a short or what a non, you know, not that much variety in the program. But this uh, junior was able, his teacher allowed him to um, include, because he was um, preparing it for the concerto competition that same semester, he was able to do, you know, with the teacher at the, doing the orchestral reduction, he was able to include the Schumann piano concerto on his recital. Normally this would not have fulfilled, you know, according to the standards that are set for undergraduate degree recitals, that doesn't have enough, I guess, variety, you could say. Um, but this particular student, his professor realized, okay, he's clearly done more than enough to fulfill the requirements at a junior performance level. Um, I've heard him perform many competitions and things, other recitals throughout the year. I can allow him to do this for his degree recital. He didn't have to include, for example, the 20, 20th slash 21st century work here. The other main theme that came up, or another main theme that came up, was that piano recital repertoire was rarely chosen on its own terms. Many people would choose works for their recital because it fits well, hello, because it fits well with something else. Um, in other words, people would often choose works for their recital in pairs, or they would try to think of the entire recital as a, as a unit. So making connections among works was a really important theme. Sometimes that connection is a chronological one. Same time period. Or sometimes they might want to choose something purposely from a couple centuries later just to balance it out. Sometimes students were able to think of a thematic or narrative storytelling connection between them. Um, of course, there's a stylistic or emotional connection between works. And some students were able to make a personal connection between works that meant a lot to them. Again, the key word is works. Works were chosen, or composers were chosen, usually in pairs, or sometimes as it were halves of a recital, as you're about to see. Um, some of the more theory-minded students tried to think about the harmonic or key signature connections between works, um, and kind of doing an, an analytical approach, which frankly would not mean much to the audience, but for the performer who had spent a year or so working on this repertoire, it often helped to think about works together because of the harmonic connections. And then finally, the overall sense of what does this work mean to the recital program as a whole. Um, now granted, that's something that undergrads, as you saw with that first program, undergrads are still kind of working on. <laughs> Um, a lot of times if a teacher doesn't really intervene, you might end up with recital programs that are either too short, or you can't fit an intermission in at the right place, or you know you might end up with really unequal halves of a recital, or you know it just wouldn't make sense. Or often what happens with undergrads, if they try to tackle too long of a work, then they can't do all the movements of a work, and then that makes it a little bit awkward, the program as well. Again, these are things that at the professional level might not necessarily be a concern. So for this student, she told me that she basically thought of her recital in halves. You know, her first half for her was by far the more difficult half, um, the, the more serious half, and the second half was the one where she was able to have fun, even though the, the repertoire might be considered just as difficult as the first half. But for her, she viewed the first half of a recital, you know, the Austro-German Austro half, the very serious and dense 
weighty, emotional half. You know, once she got that done, then she was able to relax a little bit with the second half, the more kind of French-inspired half. So there's kind of an emotional, I don't mean musically emotional, but for her as a performer, an emotional standpoint by putting the, for her, the more difficult and weightier works in the first half, and letting the second half be, for her, the quote-unquote easier works. She also, it also worked out the kind of, um, the, the geographic, I guess, or nationalistic influences that kind of govern each half of the recital. Plus the length. Um, the first half obviously was a lot longer, so I'm not even right to call it a half. But um, the first half of the recital was slightly longer than the second, and it just felt a lot longer for her as a performer. So she wanted to really go into the intermission feeling like she had tackled most of her recital and got it out of the way. Um, and then by being able to nevertheless end with a work that still had the fireworks and save, you know, she gave the impression that I saved my biggest work, my most impressive work for last, even though for her it was one that was not, again, not quite, a, for her, not quite as a hurdle as the first, any of the works in the first half. Now, recently I've started applying this kind of thinking to the professional artist recital, and I've thought about ones that I've attended, you know, the ones that I still kept the programs for, and, you know, I started thinking about one that I attended um, at Carnegie Hall, wonderful program. Um, but it's interesting, because this is, this is the type of program that you probably wouldn't see, you know, at the undergrad or even the grad level. I, I'm not sure a professor would allow that. <laughs> but... It was a wonderful recital for me because, you know, you get this appreciation for, you know, of course, the variety of music that Beethoven wrote. Um, she presented it with no intermission, which was interesting. You don't typically see that at the artist level. Not in any case, I don't know where an intermission could have gone with this program. But not only that, she, she put in her program, and no one followed this, but she put in her program that she didn't want any applause in between, that seems kind of diva-ish, I guess, but, you know, she did not want any applause at all between this sonata or that sonata, but no one listened. But it was still interesting <laughs> that she intended it for it to be in a ten-movement recital, nine-movement recital, essentially, you know. Um, and it was a wonderful experience. Um, for those of you who know how 111 ends, <laughs> you know, you can imagine the ending of 111 after three consecutive sonatas, you know, Imagine Carnegie Hall just sitting there for like, close to a minute, just absolute silence. It was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Hi, come on. So another question that I was exploring, what makes a good recital program? Now, research has shown that chronological order, even though it seems cliché, is still a prevalent way of organizing our recital programs. Let's get the Baroque stuff out of the way. Let's do our weighty sonata before intermission. Let's have the fun pieces or the flashy pieces after intermission. Other factors to think about is that certain pieces work better, better as openers or closers, um, which in turn goes with this whole stage fright and anxiety factor. Uh, many undergrads talked about putting a piece first on their recital because it was the one they were most comfortable with, which is funny because, at least from my experience, Bach has always, it's never been a super comfortable thing for me to perform, and yet I don't understand why Bach is often first, on the, Bach or Scarlatti are often first on the recital when you're the most nervous. To me, that's never been the most logical, you know, you'd never think that Bach would be a good place to, you know, to go at the very beginning of the recital. Um, I actually started one of my degree recitals with Debussy at the beginning. It was very relaxing, very nice. The other thing to think about was the audience engagement. You know, a lot of, again, performers thought more about what does the audience want to hear first? What would grab their attention? You know, let's get this really boring piece out of the way before the intermission so that they'll forget about it, and then let's put the big pieces toward the end. So, here's a case of a student who had four works, very different, all equally weighty, and all, you know, it could kind of work as far as the order goes. So, take a minute decide on a program order. What you see up on the board are the works in chronological order. So you might keep it that way, but think about it. How would you put this program recital, this recital program together? In what order would you do the pieces? You can discuss. Yeah. 
And if you don't know the pieces, think about the composers then. <laughs> So in interest of time, I will ask, is there anyone who kept it as it is? No. Nobody? Nobody? Nobody. 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 Oh, yeah? Okay. Well, here's what this student came up with. And again, this is the kind of thing that you find out with the case study, with the interview process, that wouldn't necessarily make itself known by the data. Yeah. Oh, wow. This student wanted to grab the audience's attention by getting the Prokofia first. So the most recent piece came first. Yeah. But they warmed up their fingers. <laughs> this student also wanted the chance to rest at intermission and do this after resting his fingers and relaxing. So he wanted to put it first, but in the second half of the program. Because this would not, for him, this student told me this would have been a terrible piece to start the recital with for him. But by getting the first half of the recital out of the way, and getting that hurdle done and taking a little mental break after the intermission. The bomb was a great choice to start the second half. And then he thought, after all this flashy repertory, it would actually be really cool to end his recital with a really quiet, well, the ending, the final variation is very quiet and calm. And he thought that would actually be a really cool ending to this recital. So, you know, if we had more time, we can go into the like, uh, Based on my experience, nobody ever put this piece last, which is interesting. <laughs> This is usually like right before intermission or somewhere in there. It's a wonderful piece of piece. But as a recital program closer, I found it very interesting. All right. So again, I'm going to kind of speed through these final slides here. But again, the audience experience, a lot of students thought about the recital from the audience experience and not their own. So wanting to give up either a variety of composers or the unity of a program was really important. And to, again, to extend into a professional level recitals, here was another recital I attended that was all one composer. And um, what was really interesting about this was, again, the, the two halves were roughly equal, but yet the second half felt so much shorter than the first. Okay? By putting, you know, the piece, that, by putting the block of 12 uninterrupted pieces before your intermission, Admittedly, these are, in my opinion, easier works than these, but the second half felt just so relaxed and just zipped right on by, even though they're about equal in length. But it, the second half kind of took on a, um, it's like one kind of encore after the other, and like the audience could finally applaud. <laughs> Whereas the first half, the audience never got to applaud until the very end. So that, it was a, to me, it was an interesting audience experience, just to have the same composer, but the two halves felt completely different, but both very rewarding. Now, of course, unity on a recital program might not always be good. Another place where I've started thinking about this is at the beginner level. Whoops. Uh-oh, did I skip that slide? Oh, here it is. Now, um, <laughs> yeah, because like, I don't have to say anything, but um, three of my MTNA colleagues at Florida State and I decided, hey, let's get our students together for a studio recital. None of us bothered to consult each other on what our students were playing, because uh -huh. What does that matter, right? They're beginner students. But then we ended up with a program that looked like that on the right. <laughs> and you might think, well, gee, that's not a big deal. So, but just think about you know, the parent who looks at that or the, the older student who looks at that, and there are potential messages that are sent, right? You know, are, are our students just kind of little factory models that we're just kind of sending through? And actually, some schools are like that. Every student studies the same method. Every student studies the same piece. When I had to judge um, the NISMA festival um, in New York City, I had, a t I had it was literally 10 students in a row playing for release, all oh making the same God. mistakes from the same teacher. <laughs> <laughs> from the same teacher, yeah, because for release is level four, which I don't know why. Anyway, three. That was three now. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead to um, the final here. And again, in thinking about standard repertoire, Again, back to the list, the key question we have to ask ourselves is why? What makes Beethoven, Chopin, and Bach, quote unquote, better than the other composers? 
And at this point, I have no answer other than this is what is required by our schools. This is what is required by competitions. And in turn, when I interview professors, this is what they are, in a sense, required to teach. Yes, we all like to say, oh, I, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a new music specialist. I, you know, all about new repertoire. But by and large, this is kind of our bread and butter. Of course, to think about it from the audience standpoint, you know, this is your best chance to put paying butts in the seats. You know, how likely are you to see a recital if there's not a single work or composer on there that you've never heard of? A main theme that kept coming up, and the exact words were, filling the gaps. The undergrad recital is a time to fill the gaps of knowledge. What music does a, does a student need to know? Many professors talked about the repertoire list that they would have their freshmen turn in, or even the ones they would get at the audition. Wow, look what they're missing, teaching the same things. They're all missing the same things. So it's interesting to ask yourself, what music does a student need to know? What gaps need to be filled? Do we need, then, to know contemporary or non-Western repertoire? And what gaps do we perceive in our students? Do they absolutely have to know classical sonata, or do we just, is that what we can tell ourselves, that they need to know that? And again, who will pay, if you're thinking of the artist level, who's going to pay to come to a recital? What gaps does, does our audience need to fill as listeners? So an interesting recital that I investigated was, of course, Evgeny Kissin, who uh, three years ago really broke the mold with a recital he gave, which not only featured repertoire by and large off the beaten path, but also featured him as a reciter of poetry. Uh, he had some Yiddish poems in there as well as an homage uh, to his uh, background. Very interesting. Um, and if you've never heard him speak, his voice is much deeper <laughs> than you might imagine. It's very very resonant, very deep. And the review for this recital was very telling. These departures from routine were welcome. The recital format has become so robotically predictable that we tend to forget its origins in the flamboyant self-display of Paganini and Liszt. The very idea of the word recital, which we might, you know, might not even think about, took its inspiration from the act of reciting, memorized, stage monologues and poetry readings. So, you know, in conclusion, as we think about repertoire, one of the places to think about expanding this kind of thinking is this idea of standard repertoire. When I've done this presentation with music ed students, either choral teachers or band teachers, or any instrument, really, it's always telling to get them to think about what defines standard repertoire for their respective field, and why are certain pieces performed more than others. And you'll find that a lot of people don't really think about the why, they just know what pieces are done most often. As far as contemporary and non-Western works, you know, in my, in, in my impression, a lot of them are still kind of programmed as the, you know, the hidden vegetable in your, you know, let's just get it in there. You know, let's, let's have our dessert of Bach and Beethoven be there. But let's just shove in this contemporary work, just to say and again, comparing piano with other fields, the standard rep, you know, I'm reading all the time about the Metropolitan Opera and the way they're trying to tweak their standard productions, and it's so telling and so interesting how the audience will react. And again, focus on the vital audience role. Who is your audience coming to a recital? Why do they attend these recitals? Does the music even make a difference when you think about the audience role? So thinking about your next recital, it's important to think about your role, because it's not just the pianist anymore. Are we just performers? Are we trying to educate our audience? Are we trying to advocate for something? Remember that the repertoire selection process is a complex one. It's idiosyncratic to each pianist and each teacher, and it's ultimately subjective. And again, always ask, who is the audience? Who is coming to my recital? Or who do you hope will come to your recital? And what will you play for them? A lot of repertoire is not necessarily chosen with the audience experience in mind. And a word that kept coming up in my own research, um, my own, my, 
background is also in music ed, and the word values would come up. You know, what do you value as a performer, or what do you value as a teacher to your students? Because repertoire selection, even though we might not think about it, is ultimately a reflection of our value systems and our beliefs. What is most important? What do we believe? And in that vein, think again about the power of the one-to-one -one teacher student relationship because that has a profound effect on the repertoire that is chosen. Finally, think about each individual teacher and performer. Each individual has the power to challenge and rethink whatever the standard repertoire or standard canon is. If you can instill in even one student the love of a piece that's you know, a little off the beaten path or neglected, or new or contemporary, who knows, especially in this day and age with things like you know, technology, with YouTube, with the availability of music, who knows where that planted seed can go to in the future. So I think I will stop there. I'll kind of open it up to questions. I, or do we have to stop right away? <laughs> Actually, we don't. Um, if, you, if you want to uh, take a break, now is a great time if you'd like to stay and ask questions, that's fine. Okay, then we'll just stop here, but thank, I'm, I'm up here for questions, but thank you guys for being a great time.